the State University, and we have some great TV alums here. So we just really, we know that we can do this, and because of these students that you are about to see, the parents and the universities and the collaborators that are out in the virtual land, uh, we hope that you are proud of your students. K-State, I can say, is the only 1862 predominantly white institution land grant that has hosted every 1890. So we are so proud of that. We have been truly successful, but it's only because of the mentors that are here, the mentors who are virtual, the mentors that are coming, and the universities have a partner with us and children, as well as the parents. So we have a schedule. We have 16 of our students that are going to present. We hosted 19 students this year. And uh, some have already presented because of other obligations with 1890 Scholars Program. Overall, we want you to see what the students can do and what K State has to offer and the top tier research that we are. We are a research institution here at Kansas State, but specifically the College of Agriculture and K State Research Institute. So I would like to thank um, my uh, staff. Um, Raymond Thomas, PhD candidate, just successfully completed. He's on his way to North Carolina a and I'm very proud of him. He was part of the staff. We have April Taylor Mason, a grad assistant this year, and then Summer Santiano. I'm just so proud of all of them. And this is Summer's last uh, program with us. And so we just really are proud of French. He's going on to Cornell. So it tells you we produce great people yeah. uh, here at K State. But specifically, Kirby and University, I always have to say produce some productive people because that's who we are. Even though our new president say that excellence lives here. So, are you ready? Everybody, are you ready? All right, so we're ready for you too. So, without further ado, we have our first. Uh, you ready? Okay. Uh, from Tuskegee University, where I have a more Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Demoria Pagan. I'm a sophomore and I'm a full-time student at this university. And this summer, I had the opportunity to participate in the KSI fellowship program, where I was on the mentorship of Dr. Julie Pizzoli in the Department of Plain Science and Industry. And today, I'm going to be presenting Perfect Progress, Effective Weight Loss Plan for Obese Products. Okay, so just starting off by filling hands, how many of you own cats or know some of you guys? Okay, and now how many of you give me a kind of treat or know someone who does? Let's show hands. Okay, so I just want you to keep that in mind as I begin. Um, the growing recognition of cats as essential family members has led to a notable increase in the cat population across North America. Um, food often serves as a means for pet owners to show their cats affection, which can inadvertently lead to overfeeding, and consequently, this has fueled a widespread issue of obesity among North America. And similar to humans, obese cats face a high risk for metabolic disorders and other health complications. Therefore, comprehending effective dietary and management strategies um, for overweight cats, it's crucial to grow in their overweight, their overall health. Okay, so how do we know if the cat is overweight? We have a system called body condition scoring, which is used to evaluate an animal's nutritional status and employs a nine-point scale with, uh, with one indicating extreme emaciation, and nine indicating severe obesity. The optimal body condition score for a cat typically ranges between four and five. And here's a close review. As you can see, it is evaluated based off of their ribs, waist, and abdominal fat. And... Although maintaining an appropriate body condition score is vital for the overall health of an animal, more than 50% of cats across North America are overweight or obese, making it one of the most prevalent preventable conditions in the region. And, um, obese cats are much more susceptible to clinical dysfunctions such as arthritis, diabetes, pancreatic issues, and cardiovascular problems, which can overall shorten their lifespan. And since cats tend to struggle with shedding excess weight once it has been gained, and rapid weight loss can result in hepatitic lipidosis, a weight loss regimen for overweight cats must be carefully designed considering not only age restriction, but also an ideal diet for weight loss. So, um, because of the importance of diet, 
choice in a weight loss plan, this study aims to investigate how two diets differing in their macronutrient, macronutrient composition affected the weight loss of overweight cats under an 80% energy restriction. It was hypothesized that cats set a diet specifically designed for weight management would achieve a great, greater body weight reduction compared to those maintained on a standard laboratory diet. And while conducting this project, we also decided to run an observational study to see if cats would accept an exercise plan. They were all introduced to a cat wheel and we reported which cats used the wheel and if they did, how long they used it throughout the study. And these were the two diets we used during this time. We had the standard lab diet to the left, which is used for maintenance and commonly fed to research cats. And to the right, we have the origin skin trim, which is formulated for weight management. And here is the nutritional analysis compared to what we analyzed in our lab. And as you can see to the left, the fit and trim diet had an overall higher content of crude protein and crude fat, and it had a lower amount of total dietary fiber and carbohydrates as seen by the NFB. If you will look, it did have a higher amount of metabolizable energy, which is interesting because you typically want a diet low in energy when your main goal is weight loss. And so during our study, we utilized 11 American short-haired cats with a mixture of male and female, six of which being male and five being female. They were all around the ages of three years old. And during our study, they were fed twice daily with unrestricted access to water. And all the, they were group housed in the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine. They were separated for feedings to ensure that we had the correct amount of food intake each day. Okay, so we first began our study with an um, adaptation period where um, we wanted to determine each cat's maintenance energy requirement on their lab diet. Um, NER is the amount of energy an animal needs to maintain their body weight. And there are two ways to determine NER, one of which to use equations provided by professionals, and another way is to look at the amount of food they're eating to maintain their current body weight and looking at the amount of energy in that food. And many literary sources provide different equations for calculating MER. However, this allows for a vast difference in results because of the different factors used. As you can see to the left, when you use one of our cats named Burger, equation for impact, we obtained a value of 355 kilocalories per day. However, when we use the equation for obese cats, we obtained a value of 277 kilocalories per day. And this difference is why we decided to we talked about this after MER based on the amount of food he was already eating and um, the metabolizing energy in that diet. Because if you can see, if we would have solely relied on those equations, we would have ended up overfeeding our cats. Um, once the MER was calculated, we were able um, to calculate each cat's daily food intake requirement based off of that. And uh, after they were maintained on that diet um, for the remainder of the weeks. Okay, so after our adaptation period, we began our experimental period, and the first step was determining which cats would go into which group. So any cat between a body condition score of four and five were automatically placed into the control group where they were fed 100% of their maintenance energy requirement. And any cat above a body condition score of five were randomly selected to either be placed into the lab diet group or the fit and trim diet group while still ensuring that we had an even distribution of male and females in each group and an even distribution of each body condition score. And then these cats were then subjected to an 80% energy restraint pool. Okay, and so during our experimental period, their food intake was monitored daily by observing the food off offered and weighing any leftovers. And we also monitored their body condition score and body weight each week during the season. And this is the equation we used to calculate the metabolizable energy um, intake. Okay, and now for our statistical analysis. After the experimental period, we ran our statistical analysis using a mixed model in SAS with a change from baseline and a fixed effect of diet, week, and interaction, and a random effect of cat. Significance was declared at a p-value of 0 0.05, and tendency was declared at a p-value below 0.1 and above or equal to 0.25. <laughs>
Okay, so now moving on to our results. Um, this chart is showing you a change in energy intake and the x-axis is showing you the different dietary treatments we use and the y-axis is showing you the change in energy intake. As you can see, the lab diet and the fencing diet were at the same level and this is because they were both subjected to the same 80% energy restriction while our control group did increase a little bit and this was to maintain their body weight throughout this project. Um, moving on to our change in food intake, as you can see by the chart on the left, the cats in the fit and trim group did have to undergo a more significant food, a more significant food decrease, and this is because of the high energy content. Um, and yeah, to with the chart to the right, it's showing you the food intake with the, the food intake with a with an interaction between the weeks, and as you can see. We did not change our food over the trial, and this was because we wanted to see if one diet would be more effective between the different weeks in comparison to the other diets. And you can also see that each cat ate all of their food for each week. And now for the important results, the change in body weight to the left, we can see that the fit and trim diet did have a difference between the control. However, the um, lab diet was seen more as an intermediate, and as you can see, there was a significance or a tendency right here, not significance, right, for the change in body weights. And for the change in body weight per week with the chart to the right, we can see that cats did continue to lose weight in weeks two and after week one. Okay, and for our secondary outcome, as mentioned earlier, we did introduce our cats to a cat wheel. And unfortunately, only one cat accepted it. <laughs> and um, he only used it for about 10 days. And so we tried to get him to run, but he would only lay there after the first 10 days. <laughs> and so um, although he did have an increased activity level, he did not lose more weight in comparison to our other cats. So um, future studies can look at more effective activities for cats to introduce exercise. Okay, so in conclusion, although the two diets did not show a statistical difference during the study, there was a tendency seen where the origin fitness from diet proved to be more effective in weight loss in comparison to other diets. Therefore, a larger sample size with a longer trial could prove to be beneficial. And as for future studies, we did mention we tried to introduce the cat well, so future studies can look at more effective exercise plans. And during this study, we also observed that the fit and trim diet was denser, resulting in the cats eating less in volume in comparison to the lab diet. And this could be proved this could prove to be a bad thing because cats on this diet may not feel satisfied with the amount of food that they're eating, although they are receiving a um, the optimal amount of nutrients and energy that they need. Um, and this could allow for a begging behavior to begin, which can also lead to more overfeeding. Therefore, future studies can look at hormonal indicators to determine if a cat is satisfied or not. And another thing that future studies can look at are um, client-owned pets because a big part of a weight loss plan is an owner's commitment to the plan. So that's something else we can look at. Okay, and so I would like to acknowledge Dr. Julie Pozzoli and Caitlin Bailey. They were a major help during my, my time here at K-State, and I would also like to thank Dr. Wiley, Summer, April, and Raymond. They were also a major help. And so thank you. Here's my contact information, and the floor is open for any questions. No questions? <laughs> so you and uh you looked at extruded dry type pet food right uh a lot of cats get fed canned wet type do you think there's uh how do you think your results would uh match up to Cats eating some other type of diet, form of diet. I don't 
don't know. We mainly looked at the macronutrient composition. So although there were two different diets, um, so I'm not really sure. Um, the reason I do know that the Origin Fit and Trim diet did have a tendency to do better was because there was um, an amino acid derivative known as l card carotene, which also helps with weight loss. So I think that's why it did do better, although the macronutrient composition was different. So I'm not sure how it would compare to another diet. Right. Okay. No, it's How y'all doing today? My name is Avion Brown. I had the privilege of working with Dr. Toby Morberg in the Department of Agronomy on my project, Water Level Evaluation and Bison Wallows. All right, so bison wallows. What is a bison wallow? A bison wallow is a small depression of wetland found in the Great Plains. It's seasonally ponded in the spring and dry by midsummer. All right, so background. You're probably wondering why it's called bison wallow, right? Did the bison make them? And no, not quite, not quite. Okay, so a common misconception is bison wallows, they were formed by pseudogenesis. So bison wallows form in the um, sodic clay pan, which is this green area right here. And the sodic clay pan normally sits on what we like to call a saddle. So the saddle is like this. It's a hill formation, and if you've ever seen a saddle before, it kind of dips in. So in the hydrology, we have an aquitard, which is this purple thing right here. And then we have a perch water table. When a water table is on a hill, it tends to curve upwards. So when the saddle and the water table meet, what we get is a bison wallow. So bison wallows have a high clay content, about over 30 35%, high sodium content relative to nearby soils. The vegetation is different, so you will see different types of shrubs, different types of grasses, things of that nature. And the water purchased on the clay pan created in hydro conditions. So my research question for the summer was, what are the hydrology and hydro soil characteristics of bison wallows at Randall's Creek? My research, research objectives was analyze well data for July 2023 to July 2024, document reducing conditions for the 2024 growing season, and conduct rainfall normality analysis. So right here, these are hydro soil conditions. You don't really see them too much at the top because it's not getting wet, and therefore anaerobic conditions are not very much present. So right here in these lower two levels, you do see hydric soil conditions. And that's, uh, you can kind of see that by like the orange blotches. It's almost like rusting for the soils. This is my study site, Reynolds Prairie, a native tall grass prairie located in the Flint Hills. Let me give y'all a second to take it in. It's a very beautiful site. All right, so my methods. First, first thing I wanted to do was collect the two-inch soil core. This was just for a later analysis, so I know what kind of soil we were dealing with. After that, I will use a soil auger, which is documented right here. So I'll put it in the ground, push it a couple of times, and try to get about to a meter in depth. After that, sometimes, you know, the soil, you have rocks in it, you have clay, so we couldn't always get to exactly a meter. So we would always record the depth so we could do any type of analysis later on. It. So after that, we would assemble the well and place it in a hole. It's nothing too fancy, just a three-part PVC pipe. So the top part is just normal PVC, but the second part has striations in it. And the striations allow, allow for water to fill up. And then the bottom part is just like a cap. So nothing else sits in it. After that, I will line the well with sand and cap it with bentonite. So we lined it with sand because sand allows water to permeate very easily. And bentonite is a type of clay and we will put that on top so nothing else can get in and mess up the data that we were collecting. I would place a well cap 
which is this yellow thing right here, and a data logger, which is seen up top. This is a diagram of the well. So A is just from the soil surface to the water table. B is the well count. C is the second PVC pipe with the striations in it. E is the top PVC pipe, just normal PVC. D is the bottom cap, so we make sure no dirt gets in. F is from the soil surface to the sensor of the data logger. So the sensor is this right here, the little hole. And then G is from the soil surface to the bottom of the data logger. This is just the well when it's filled up, just to give you a picture. The data logger does not move. What it's measuring is pressure. So here are my methods for analyzing soil reduction. We use indicator of iris of reduction in soils or iris film. We have five iris films per location at three locations, the center, the edge, and the upper end. My, my study was focused on the edge. So the steps. First, iris films were inserted for 30 days. After that, they would be removed, washed, and documented. We would analyze it on something called MHJ. So what MHJ is, it's a scientific analysis program, and it was analyzed if we could, if we had over 30% removal in any area. So what we needed to see was a 15 centimeter layer with over 30% of iron removal. It needed to start anywhere within the top 15 centimeters. So it could be from 10 to 25, 15 to 30, or even, you know, zero to 15. It needed to occur in three out of five hours so. Next, we did rainfall normality analysis. Wetland, hydrology, and soil reduction only matter in normal years. That's going to be important later. We use the DARE method or direct antecedent rainfall evaluation method. It's a tabular ranking method that considers total rainfall in previous three months. Months are categorized based on monthly rainfall total. An example would be June 2024, we had 5.97 inches of rain, and that would be considered normal. Normal is if it's between the 30th and the 70th percentile. So here are my results. What we have up top is a hydrograph. graph. So the brown line indicates the soil surface. Anytime it's above the brown line, what we have is flooded conditions. But what we're looking for is when it was above those orange lines that you see, that means the water table was over 30 centimeters in depth. But what we really were looking for was that green line. When was it above 30 centimeters for 30 or longer consecutive days? And you can see that happened for us between April 19th and May 31st. Down below, we have a precipitation graph. And you can see that graph, the graph up top and the graph down low, they kind of coincide what we got. Because you can see this is a time of abnormally high rainfall. Now to the left, we have, uh, again, iris films. On the first one, we have the April one. We did not see 30% reduction in a 15 centimeter layer. But on the second one, we did see that 30% of removal in iron film. After that, I did a rainfall normality and next steps. So this, how this works is we would analyze the rainfall. So if it was between 30 and 70, it would be considered normal. If it was below 30, it would be considered dry and above the 70th would be considered wet. So then those each had a ranking that coincide with them. So dry would be a one, normal would be a two, wet would be a three. Then we weighed the months out. The furthest month back would be a one, second furthest would be a two, and the closest month to us would be a three. So the condition value and the monthly weight would get multiplied and that would end up in the product category. After that, we would add the product and see what we got and analyze it back on this, based on this ranking table seen right here. So what we got was a wetter than normal season. Because it was wetter than, because it was wetter than normal, we got to do a concurrent study because we don't really want to see two wet conditions. We can't really analyze if the soil is hydric if it's overly wet. Here are my references, acknowledgements, I want to say thank you to Dr. Riley for just having me out here, giving me the ability to meet my amazing cohorts. Uh, thank you for Summer. She did a whole lot for us, worked really hard. Uh, thank you to Haley and Taylor. They used to stand outside with me in the 90 degree heat. Uh, I want to say thank you to Dr. Young if she's listening and Dr. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. What have you done previous research? How did that compare to what you did this? So previously, I worked in a wetland in Maine. That was very interesting, but it was more like this is a plano wetland, and the one I was working in was like a more forested one. So it was just just a different environment. You know? And this one is mostly dry. And the one I previously worked in was mostly wet. So I was learning more about dry conditions this time. So 
I hope to be able to just incorporate both knowledge and push them back. Yeah, so we had an incredibly wet summer. Um, how do you feel like you were able to sort of still accomplish what you wanted with your research, given the kind of unusual weather we had? So like I said earlier, we didn't really get the results that we wanted because it was so abnormally wet, but I still think that research can be used and can be bottled just for maybe like any time we have an abnormally wet season again. So I don't think it was a failure or anything, but we learned a lot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, fellows. As questions are being asked, repeat the question into the microphone so those on Zoom can also hear the question. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carol Hines. I'm a junior agriculture major from Virginia State University. This summer, I had the opportunity to study under Dr. Turman in the Department of Entomology. This summer, my research was over the crop preference of the Tetramoran immigrants to pay the hand on urban organic farms. Here's some of the points we're going to be covering. Now, urban farming is a growing practice in urban areas that promotes food security and also more sustainable methods of practice. Due to the presence of crops in these localized areas, pest control is always going to be a concern. Organic means of pesticides is well, organic means of pest control is encouraged due to chemical pesticides being an issue of health and public safety due to the close proximity of humans to the urban area if you're going to use pesticides. So effectively manage pests in these urban areas, it's important to know what pests are going against and also how to behave and how they affect the vegetation in these urban areas. The insect that is the pest in this particular project is the pavement ant. Pavement ants are highly aggressive ants native to Europe that have the uh, native to Europe, but also inhabit northeastern locations of the United States that have the ability to consume insects and high, level, high levels of vegetation in urban areas. They have the ability to form large colonies with multiple queens to forage extensively across uh, mass levels of vegetation. Now, we had an organic farmer in Kansas City that had an issue with mainly her brassicalia, so her spinach, broccoli, her kale, uh, getting uprooted and damaged by ants. Now, what we do know is that ants are usually beneficial, not pests. They usually go out their way forage extens uh, foraging extensively across vegetation, uh, getting rid of pests that do harm the crops. This particular farmer used the treatment of spinosad to treat and try and reduce the numbers of ants that were causing uprooting and damage of her crops. Now, spinosad is a granulated pesticide used in it to seduce insect baiting trap in the motive to try and get the worker ants to take the seduce insect baiting trap back to the queen to actually reduce the number of insects that were in the area. Now, while spinosad can be used to reduce the amount of ants in these areas, they can also affect the abundance of other invertebrate that can be beneficial in these urban areas. My objective for this experiment was to quantify the ant pressure of, uh, of the pavement ants on this particular organic farm, measuring the ant activity in cultivated areas versus uncultivated areas. So areas that had crops versus areas that might have not had crops and just had grasses and in our own place. Also seeing the cultivated areas that were treated and seeing if there was a difference in that in activity in correlation with uncultivated regions that were not treated by the farmer. Also wanted to see how the spinosad treatment would affect other invertebrate that could be beneficial for the farm. Now I had eight sites in total. I had four and eight cultivated sites. I have four uncultivated sites and I have four uncultivated sites. The uncultivated sites that you can see are represented by the yellow triangle. I had two in the north fence, and then I had one in the southwest region of the farm called Beehive. 
that is put by uh, uncultivated area by four beehives. In the southeastern sector, I have one called goat because it was put by pasteurized area that goats were having very loud screaming goats. <laughs> now for my cultivated area, I represented by the red square that you can see. I had one in the northwestern sector, which was dill. No, northwestern sector, which was okra. Centralized sector, which was dill. Northeastern sector, which was tomato and pepper. And then I have my potato right under it. Now I used a pitfall trap to, I used a pitfall trap to measure the ant activity in each site. A pitfall trap is a simple yet effective device that captures ground dwelling insects that are inhabiting the areas of these crops. Now a pitfall trap consists of two solo cups, one that has three holes, with, three holes in it and one that doesn't have three holes in it, placed in and then filled up three fourths all the way up with soapy water. And then uh, chicken wire is covered over it. Two ground staples are placed. And then the plastic cover is covered. Plastic cover is put over it. And then two more ground staples are put in place of that to hold it down. Now, when the plastic cover is put down, you want to make sure it's not directly on the soil, but essentially elevated off the soil so that ground dwelling insects do have the ability to get under for proper data collection. Now, when we picked up the sites, picked up the traps, we took everything out, all the ground staples, and then poured the soapy water that had the specimens into it, into that funnel that you might be able to see. And then after that, we filled it up with ethanol to preserve the specimens so the ants and all the other insects took it over to the lab for further observation and identification, put it in the Petri dish, and then with forceps, we sorted them out and with a clicker, uh, got a precise count of all the ants and all the other invertebrae that were uh, in each site. Now you might be thinking, how do you know it's the Tetramorium immigrants? How do you know it's the pavement ant? We keyed this specific ant based on morphological characteristics. From the top right images going down, some of the keys that we differentiated this ant with the others were the 12, sub 12 segmented antenna with the three club region at the end. It's vertical facial striations that you might be able to see in that image in the middle. And then the two petiole nodes that separate his body. Now in the cultivated regions, something interesting that we saw was that in the first three sites that we had with our dill, our tomato and pepper and our potato, there was an extreme, uh, extreme low insect count and ant count in these three sites. But then we, but then with okra, we see that there was 2,804 ants. So an abnormal amount of ants in this particular site. With our uncultivated uh, sites, we see that with our north fence, both of our north fences, beehive and go, it was a very moderate number of insects and ants present. Uh, we had an average of 243 ants that were seen in our uncultivated areas and an average of 175 insects that were in our uncultivated areas. So very moderate numbers. Again, another image, you could just see how absolutely no ants, no insects, then an abnormal amount of ants that were in the okra and then with uncultivated areas, very moderate for the most part. In conclusion, pavement ants are seen in uncultivated areas and cultivated areas on two birds farm. Uncultivated areas are seen to have a moderate number of ants and other insects, so moderate abundance uh, untreated. Cultivated areas are seen to have a very low number of ants, uh, lower ant and insect count. This could be a result of the treatment of spinosad because spinosad does have the four to five week uh, four to five weeks potence uh, and loses its effectiveness after five weeks. Further data collection on cultivated locations and other uh, urban farms to see if the presence of the pavement and on crops is something that we see on other farms and also allowing traps to be put down on the specific farm without the presence of spinosad to see if if there is a trend or a change in the type of results that we get and then also making sure that we put down multiple trials. We do multiple trials to determine if there is a trend through time without the spin treatment. These are my references. 
I uh, first like to acknowledge Dr. Kim for giving me the opportunity to study with her and do this research with her over the summer. I'd like to thank everybody in Dr. Kim's lab for helping me if it was with traps, picking up, identification. Uh, definitely uh, thank you to Gus, Fable, Ella, Kaylin for giving me all the information on the farms because, you know, just trying to help out. I really thank you for that. I'd like to thank everybody in the DPO program. So uh, Dr. Wiley, Summer, April, Raymond, always giving that helping hand when I needed it. And of course, I want to thank uh, everybody in the KSRE family for making this program something nice and something meaningful. Thank you. Questions? I did have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. So was there a particular reason that you placed them? Um, for instance, I know you said you placed one by the beehive and um, a couple of by like what goats was there. Any particular reason why they were placed in many different areas? And if so, um, could you explain that? So we wanted to make sure, especially with the uncultivated areas where uh, where we put our sites that they were bordering around uh, Two Birds Farm. So it wouldn't be, if we had put all of our sites just on the northern, like northern border, northern border of Two Birds, uh, it wouldn't have been good for data collection. So we wanted to make sure that we had a variety of sites put down in each area. Okay. Do you have any uh, idea why the okra attracted the ants or did the okra, or was that just a coincidental thing in your mind? See, that's something that we actually were looking into. So particularly with the okra, the farmer did put spin sack by the okra, but something that could have happened is we know that this is an organic farmer. So spin sack isn't something that, that is not something that wants to be like, that they want to put on the farm. So it could have been poured in a different region of the okra site, but maybe not directly on that site where we had put down our trap. Well, how is the owner gonna use your results here? What might she do or what? Uh, crop rotation would definitely be one of the things that I would say are important when it comes to these results in general, but we can't uh, have any implications yet just because of the spinosad treatment. Um, with further with further traps and sites that are um, put down without the presence of spinosad, uh, more data on where the ants would reside would be more prominent. Okay. Um, good morning, good morning, everyone. My name is Hannah Jackson. I'm just senior agriculture major with a concentration in animal food sciences, and I take a for any university. And today I'll be presenting to you guys about evaluating the effects of rumen for and cherry from the integrated Just to run through for a presentation of over my background, my methods, my results, my methods, and my knowledge. So postpartum dairy cows undergo a significant physiological physiological change during and after counting. They require additional energy for milk production. Proper diet formulation can help support increased energy demand. Specialized diets must be designed to help cows navigate and transition from gestation to lactation. Uh, now I'm going to jump into a bit about diet fermentability. Diet fermentability refers to the ability of diet components to be broken down by microbes in the cow's rumen. 
Highly fermentable diets support growth and activity of lean microbes and minimize excessive gas, gas production. More fermentable diets suppress intake and postpartum dairy cows, such as high moisture corn or wheat. Maximizing feed intake postpartum is key to successful lactation. By balancing fermentable carbohydrates, such as corn and wheat, with forages, it can help maintain optimal rumen pH and microbial activity. Um, rumen protected choline is a quasi vitamin protected from ruminal degradation, which means the choline bypasses the rumen so cows can absorb all nutrients. Um, this is essential for fat metabolism, liver health, and overall cow performance, especially during the high energy demand period for postpartum dairy cows. The combination of diet fermentability and rumen protected choline has not yet been assessed in postpartum dairy cows. By combining these approaches, we can ensure that cows receive balanced nutrients, enhancing their ability for lactation and improving overall health and productivity. By understanding the interaction between diet fermentability and rumen fermentation of postpartum dairy cows, we can better deploy, deploy nutritional strategies to help cows adapt. This study for research objective was going to assess the inclusion of rumen protected choline in diets with varying fermentability effects, how they affect feed intake and milk production. So, for the methods for my study, cows before they uh, but the beginning of the study, there are some to a diet including green protected choline and no choline, which is red or purple. So red is the control, which is without choline, and purple is um, the treatment. So using electronic feed bonds, it enables data collection of, the, of their individual feed intake. So cows wear collars. The cows wear a collar that they that allows them to access the feed box, and it monitors how much and how much they eat and when they eat. Um, after cows have their babies, they are then moved into the Tysol barn. So over the course of the study, we had 24 cows that were moved into this barn where they were fed one of four treatments. Uh, number one is corn, which is with, with no choline, two, corn with choline, three, wheat with no choline, and four, wheat with choline, or simple, pink, yellow, green, and blue. So for our feeding protocols, the cows were enrolled in the study for 21 days, and they're fed two times a day at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. The feed is offered and refused, and they are monitored on a computerized system to determine dry matter intake. So this top picture is for a cow feed sheet. We monitor how much they eat and how much they are refused. And we've mixed the forage and the grain together. So this here is the treatment, and that there's the forage. And as you can see in my picture, I'm mixing the feed and a feed and the grain together. As far as milking protocols, cows were milked three times a day, 6 a.m., 11 a.m., and 7 p.m. And the milk weights are recorded with the computerized system. So for our data and our results, we used um, statistical analysis system with mixed models. We focused on the fixed effects of grain type, RPC, whether it had choline or no choline, the days in milk and their interactions. So for my first results graph, um, we discovered that the wheat diet without choline actually tended to increase milk production more than any of the other treatments. And it had a greater milk production than what we expected than for the treatments with choline. And on the y-axis, this is the milk and pound for the days. And then this x-axis, this is for each treatment. So this is our days in milk graph. Uh, days in milk is the number of days the average cow is milking since the day that they have babies. This bottom is the days they're on study, and then it's also milk and pounds per day. So overall, milk, and pro milk production increased regardless of the treatment, which is a pattern typically that we expected for postpartum dairy cows. As for our dry matter intake results, overall, none of the treatments really affected dry matter intake. It kind of was the same throughout for all the treatments. Um, so all the treatments were roughly the same. 
as far as um, another dry matter intake, this is our line graph. And it's just going to show you how there's really no significant change overall for the study. Um, for our next steps, for this, there were really no overall effects in our goals for dry matter intake. However, we did find that wheat without choline increased milk production. More research will be needed to, to determine how like wheat without choline has increased milk production as we did not really expect it to. Um, this study is still ongoing, so there will be further research needed. And these are my references. And for my acknowledgement, I would like to acknowledge the Dean of Ag, both of uh, the assistants, uh, my mentor, Dr. Billy Brown, my grad assistant, Kelsey Pesh, Dr. Wiley, the DPO office, summer, April, and Brendan. Thank you for your time. It's so you had a surprise, right? Can you speak a little loud, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so you had a surprise. You weren't expecting wheat without choline to improve milk production. Um, if, can you talk through a little bit what you can see as the next steps in, in this research, given that- um, As far as the next steps, I believe, the study won't be over until November. So maybe the other treatments will kind of come up and balance it out. But as for reasoning, I believe the wheat that we have is dry rolled. So it is a little bit more highly fermentable for the cows and helps um, with their uh, milk production and feed intake. There's more research overall would be needed for the wheat without okay. coding. Yeah, thank you. I have a question on you. Was there a difference in the quality of the milk on the wheat outside of the increased production? I'm not too sure. More research would be needed, but I can also refer them to my mentor and we can link up that with do you want to answer the question? Okay. Would you like to answer the question? Uh, so yeah, that that is forthcoming. We have the samples for those, but we have not analyzed. Here, so you pay us our fellow in the comments. Uh, for entomology under Dr. McCormack and Dr. Ivan Gruhala. And I'm here to present helping our brother buzzing friends stay healthy. Pollinators are a large contributor to our environment, keep our plant families intact, and our contribution creates a ripple towards the ecosystems and communities of, and bring forward floral resources and nectar and pollen. Pollen. Is a, is a substance that diversifies sexual reproduction and maintains diversity in, in something a strive is strive for as genes become stronger and certain plants are needed to stay alive. As they can be destroyed or modified due to their dismay and because of insecticides and fragmentation of floral resources due to human construction and advancing to track suitable pollen sources. Our example for tracking data lines was using machine learning. Machine learning is the ability to feed images to, to practice an algorithm. Our objective, our objective was to train a detection model using imagery collected with remote sensors, our GoPros, and at a determined predetermined distances, which to measure. Our next uh, objective was to measure accuracy of the algorithm that detects and identifies the lines from optical sensors and determine models, performances on test images and drone data for future detection from remote distance. 
or our materials and method methods. You here you have me um uh, making the PVC three PVC uh pipe apparatuses with our GoPro at the uh, top and take pictures uh, in the field of the dandelions. Um, we we uh there was uh around three of us and three of the uh, assistant researchers out in the field. First part of the process was taking um uh, was uh, putting the images and uploading the RubbleFlow. RubbleFlow is a computer application company that streamlines the process of a computer model, which has a lot of variations and specifications to analyze different data sets. As RubbleFlow has one built inside of a system, but first we had to crop our images. There was a total of around. 2,763 images, and it was split up between the uh, assistant research team. Next came a, a labeling and integral. We uh, labeled them using a bounding box, which is a box uh, that identifies and describes them label. And then we were able to label them as the tear off, which is a bare code for data lines, which is for, for use to rest things. Then it, all these images were split into a training model. They they had to be resized because of the large uh the largest uh large data in the picture. So we had to resize them to be able to be at four four sixteen by four sixteen pixels. In the training, uh, we the first thing we did was training was testing the reliability of the data set. Then the next phase was putting them in a validation set, which is the phase where their hyperimeter were tested. Then testing was giving the models, giving the model images that it had never seen before in a training set. And then most of our images were in a training set, which was 70%, uh, 70% about. Here we go. Next was uh next was our validation set, which was twenty percent of our images, and then the testing set was ten percent of our images. Here's our performance metrics. We have MAP point five, which is which is an evaluation at um at fifty percent, which was at ninety percent. Well, by fifty percent, the precision. Was at which was at ninety five point three percent, which is the ability for if if the model was making the decisions correctly, and then we have the recall, and that's uh, the ability for uh, did the uh, was the model be able to guess when it was supposed to? Uh, here's the metrics at the bottom. We have. The MAP 0.5 percentage, and here, it will, well, this graph is measured in epochs, which is the ability to train itself through uh through the model and go through the model and see what was the differences. Here, it went up to up to 200. It's it has the ability to stop at 100, but there were still some parameters there that it still didn't understand, so it extended itself to 200. This detection. The only misdetections that we had here, well, we had the reason why we had such a high percentage at 95% was because it mostly identified them. But when it identified like a dandelion at a different angle where two of them were together, that's the only reason why it was able to misdetect. And it also has the ability to um, identify other pictures, I mean, other flowers with the same structure as it, like, ones that are identified here with the tags and the percentages. And then the other sunflowers over there, it wasn't able to identify. So it's kind of like focused on those type of structures. Conclusions, detection, the detection, the detection and location of flow resources is possible using machine learning. Our model can be further developed and applied into imagery or video collected with other sensors and can, can, this, can significantly reduce sampling time. As, as an example in this picture, if you were to count these, that would take a longer amount of time in which the model would be able to take them in milliseconds. 
here we have the picture. Uh, here we have the drone identifying dandelions out in the field. And then our future research was uh, estimating pollinators uh, abundance and importing into the satellite data, and then as well as flow resource surveys. I'd like to acknowledge everyone, Dr. McCormack, Ivan, uh, Summer, and Dr. Wiley as well, and the assistant research team. Are there any questions? I do have a quick question. Yes. So what type of bees were you trying to keep safe necessarily? Are you using the imaging to identify um, dandelions in the field just because- Could you restate were... the question, ma'am? I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so what type of bees are you trying to keep safe? I mean, what type of, we're, we're, we're trying to identify use any type of bees in a, in a sense but um it, it, it's for we did research in the um in the field be able being able to identify just different type of bees and that's more research we have to use we had like an app to be able to use a picture to to be able to identify bees but it would be any type of bee and it's like it takes more research on the bee side because that took a lot a lot of uh a lot of our research any other questions Yes, I'm in the back. Uh, so you talked about how accurate the machine learning was at identifying dandelions. How, yes. how accurate are humans? So are, are we doing better, we're just slower, or are we also prone to error in the same way? Uh, could, could, you define, could you ask the one question one more time? I'm trying to understand. I think it sounds like machine learning then allows us to count more dandelions faster. Yes. Humans are slower. Yes. It, 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 it's more accurate. I mean, are we more accurate? It's it's a lot of different striations and stuff like that. But when be able to put it in a machine, it takes a lot of labor and research. We have to be out in the field counting them. It takes a lot. We can be tired, but with this, we can just have the ability to just look at the image and then be able to put it on a graph and like metric it. Okay. If you if you can understand what that means. Yep. Thank you. One more questions. Since we are running ahead of schedule, I think it'd be best if we go ahead and move on with the next presentation. So, Urban. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Urban Richard. I'm a senior at Virginia State University, majoring in family consumer science, conversation dietetics, with minor in chemistry. This summer, I was under the mentorship of Dr. Phoebus and Yara Abi Nafu. Our research is on using nanobubbles containing parasitic acid to control the growth of static biofilm in beef processing. During this pre presentation, this will be my outline. Blue recall is a common issue in today's society, and this can be caused by pathogens that makes one sick. An example is 90% of consumers infected with shiga toxin producing E. coli or estic will produce symptoms of bloody diarrhea, while 5 and 10% will have hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is where E. coli produces toxins that attack the red blood cells inside your kidney, which will lead to kidney failure. Another issue is food spoiling organisms that shorten the shelf life of meat. A big issue that the meat industry have is in controlling pathogenic and food spoiling organisms from growing in their food. And that's due to their capability of forming biofilm. Biofilm is a sticky protective layer composed of polysaturides, lipids, and DNA, and they encompass many organisms in them. This barrier allows it to be highly resistant to chemical, physical, and mechanical treatment. 
As you can see in the picture on the bottom left, the circle shows what an organism looks like in a biofilm, while the rectangle shows filaments that act as cement that sticks them to surfaces. Now for our experiment, we'll be using nanobubbles to try and inhibit the growth of biofilm. Nanobubbles are categorized as anything smaller than 200 nanometers. The ones we generated in our lab were 80 nanometers. And what's great about these this nanobubbles is that they stay in solution, unlike bubbles of soda that will rise to the top and dissipate. Also, what's great is that we can fill these nanobubbles with many gases, such as nitrogen and oxygen. The ones used in the lab were sterile medical grade air. Now, as you can see on the bottom right is a photo of what nanobubbles does to biofilm. Nanobubble will reduce the surface tension of the biofilm, thus detaching it from any surfaces, while the oxygen within will kill any cells found within. The objectives of this experiment is to see how effective nanobubbles are at inhibiting biofilm formation, both alone and with adding concentrations of parasitic acid. The hypothesis is that nanowater containing increasing concentrations of parasitic acid will reduce the rate of biofilm over a 10-day period. The experiment is set up in a way to mimic that of a beef processing plant. So we have 12 vessels filled with either nanobubble water or tap water. From there, we place beef purge of 5 or 10% coming from vacuum-sealed meat. The beef purge will mimic that of the organic matter found in beef processing plants. And from there, we inoculate these 12 vessels with five, a cocktail of five surrogate strain of E. coli. We use surrogate strain because they are safe, not, pathogen not non pathogenic, but they have the same characteristics as their pathogenic counterpart. That means that we have a safe experiment that have the same results. But, uh, and then also we'll add varying concentrations of parasitic acid. We'll have zero, 200, and 400 concentrations. Our last two vessels to make 14 will be our control. We will just add water with zero concentrations of parasitic acid. Then we'll add five and 10% purge. And we will not inoculate them with the five surrogate strain of E. coli. From there, we'll place two types of sterile coupons on the bottom left, as you can see, which are material of rubber and stainless steel. We use these, rub these materials because they are found in bee processing plants and we wanna see the growth of biofilm on them. So we'll place four rubber and then four stainless steel into each vessel counting eight vessels throughout the 10-day period. Now on day zero, three, five, and 10 are our sampling days. From then we'll be collecting both planktonic samples and coupon samples. Planktonic meaning free filling cells found in the vessels. As you can see, we'll collect one milliliter from each vessel and from dilutions and place them onto EB petrofilm or APC petrofilm. APC are non-selective Petrofilm, so that means that anything aerobic can grow into them. While EB plates are very selective, so only enteric bacteria, meaning bacteria found inside your gut, will grow. Now for coupon sampling, this is more of a rigorous setup because the biofilm are now attached to the coupons. And we'll follow the CDC protocol on detaching and collecting these samples. As you can see, we'll start first by placing DE broad, the coupons in DE broad filled section petri dishes and allow them to stay there for a minute to neutralize the acid. From there, we'll place E coupon into individualized conical vials filled with 25 milliliters of phosphate buffer saline so that we are not rupturing the cells. From there, we'll alternate between vortexin and sonication. Vortex using vibration and then sonication using sound frequency to detach the biofilm from the coupons. Now onto our results. Here shows the planktonic cell counts in 10% beef purge, 10% being a very high concentration of organic matter. So the graph on the left shows EB, the selective plates, while the right shows APC. So for the y-axis, we'll be showing logs per mil of cell count. So, so do you guys know, log one log equals 10 cell count, while two log is 100, three log is 1,000. So by the time you get to six logs, you start smelling decay in the meat. And that's due to the high numbers of food spawn organisms found within. The x-axis will show the days we sampled, day 0, 3, 5, and 10. Now, the solid graph, the solid color means that it's water, while the, shape, the stripes will show nanowater. And the different colors will show the different concentrations of the parasitic acid, with blue being zero concentrations, green being 200, orange being 400, and our control being gray. So we'll start on the graph on the left. 
as we can see, foreign good concentrations was very effective at inhibiting planktonic cell growth over time from day zero to day 10. While for the 200% parasitic acid concentration, which is green, we see that from zero to three it inhibited, but then over time there was growth that did occur. Now the graph on the right, we see growth did occur on day 10 for 400 concentrations, but minimal growth. And then also we see varying growth occurring for the 200 concentrations. From zero, it was high, then it went lower day three, then high again on day five, but then lower on day 10. But we see that it's very controlled data. Since it's lower than, the data values are still lower on day 10 from 6.1 for the control and zero parasitic had 6.2, while our data on day 10 were very minimal. Now for planktonic cell counts in 5% beat first, this will be a moderate level of organic matter. The graph on the left shows that both 200 and 400 concentrations showed to be very effective for both for all the days. While on the right, we see that for day 10, 400, there was a minimal growth on for the 400 concentrations. Now for 200, we see minimal growth did occur on day five with some growth again continuing on day 10, but still very lower than the control and the 0% of parasitic acid. Now to biofilm growth coupons in 10% purged. This time, the left graph will show nanowater with different concentrations of parasitic acid. The right graph will show tap water with different concentrations of parasitic acid. So this time, the solids will be stainless steel coupons and the stripes will be rubber coupons. The graph on the left shows that 400 concentrations was very effective from day zero to 10. While we see for the 200 that we did get some growth over time. Now for the graph on the right, we see that 400 and 200 was effective, 400 being effective on day three, while 200, the green graph, shows that it was very effective on day 10. Now for biofilm growth of coupons in B first 5%, we see that both nanowater and tap water with different variations of parasitic acid were both effective in the same way. We see that on day zero, they both have some growth, but then on day three onward, there was minimal or no growth. In conclusion, we can see that in plantonic growth, we see that nanobubbles was very effective use in, min in minimizing the growth of platonic cells. Now for the data for, e for the biofilm coupons, we see that both nanowater and tap water were showing similar results. Due to the time constraint of her data, we only were able to do our data for two repetitions. We'll have to continue doing more repetitions, which grad student Yara will continue throughout this semester so we can get more data to differentiate between the effects of tap water and nanobot water. With more repetitions and data, we'll have we'll be able to do statistical analysis to check for significance. Now the implications of this experiment, we see that purge concentration has an effect on how perfect or how the treatment works. We see that higher 10% purge was able to allow biofilm and plantonic cells to grow back, while 5% was very effective in our treatment. Now this is a starting of just the first part of the research. We're doing research on static biofilm formation. The next step for Yara's research is to see the effect of nanobubble and parasitic acid on dynamically developed biofilm growth. And that means that nanobubbles will be under stress of flowing water, purge, and parasitic acid. And we know that biofilm under stress will be more highly resistant. So it'd be great to see the results that Yara will get from her research. I want to acknowledge Dr. Minton, Dr. Shu for allowing us to be here. I want to thank Dr. Phoebus for being a great mentor to me throughout this experiment. I want to thank Dr. Trinetta for a lot, for walking through with us in our procedure. I want to thank Yara for being a great mentor to me as well throughout my time here. I want to thank Dr. Wiley, Summer, April, Raymond for being a helping hand when I had tough times through this program. I also want to thank ASU for letting us use her sonicator and showing the proper way to clean the coupons. And lastly, I want to thank Mariana for being a helping hand in the lab. Thank you, any questions? I have a question on Zoom. All right, yes, you can go person on Zoom. Thank you. So how would, um, sorry. how would this impact the overall cost of the beef if his purge treatment is used? Would that, well, I don't know if it would change the cost of beef for us, but I believe that it'd be a nice measure for the beef processing plant over time. Uh, 
And the other question on Zoom is what did you enjoy about your experience? I love being in the lab and I enjoyed all the experience I had. Um, I had fun. I would truly say I had fun working under Dr. Phoebus and Yara. They were very knowledgeable and I like to be a sponge to them. Yeah, with your experience in, uh, in the lab, what was it that contributed to the access of having a state compared to uh, I mean, what's the difference? Is there a difference in the cost? Because as you said, platonic, not plant tonic. So I just wanted to see where you can go. Uh, can you describe it in a different way? If I, if I can understand correctly, you're saying, what's the difference between the organisms found in different kind of meat? Yes, pretty much. That I'm not too sure. I do know that for beef is mostly E. coli or it's found inside our gut and salmonella is mostly for chicken, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Any more questions? Thank you. With that, I think we're going to go ahead and take about a 30 minute break for um, lunch and then we'll come back yeah. and start presentations again. So, Thank you all. If you do not plan on coming back, I'll be sharing with Sparto screen. If you can take it, and let us know how the storm was this morning. That was great. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Take your time, baby. Good afternoon. My name is Zaria Hextall. I'm a senior at Virginia State University. And this summer, I had the pleasure of working under Dr. Cowley in the Department of Grain Sciences and Industry. And my research for this summer focuses on the significance of atmospheric cold plasma treatments on the disinfestation of the Colossobrucus maculatus or the cowpea weevil in the cowpea. Just an overview of my contents that I'll be going over for today. I'll be going over my introduction, objectives, materials and methods, my results, followed by my conclusion and future studies, along with my references and my acknowledgements. Legumes are grains that are frequently grown and they're crucial for both human health and the environment. Farmers typically grow legumes as they are they contain nitrogen, which is essential for soil health, and they're also good for crop rotation, as they can be planted in between harvest and overall help reduce weeds. The legume that my research focuses on is the cowpea, also known as the black IP. And since there, there's a high demand for legumes in the agriculture industry, frequently during transport when they're being transported from one location to the next, they're commonly susceptible to different kinds of pests. The pests in question that my research focuses on is the cowpea weevil, 
and that is an internal feeder that infests cowpeas and different varieties of beans. When the female cowpea weevil lays her egg on the outer shell of the cowpea, the larvae bores the hole inside the bean and lives out its entire life cycle from the inside of the bean, feeding internally. And then when it reaches the adult phase, it emerges out and therefore damaging all of the inner properties of the bean. Chemical disinfestation methods are widely used for convenience purposes, yet they have limited use in the food, grain, and science industry. Canal Focus has shifted to more non-thermal methods, such as cold plasma technology, to tackle these infestation issues in the world of agriculture. Plasma is the fourth state of matter along with solid liquids and gases. When heat is added onto gas, it ionizes into plasma. There's two different kinds. There's hot plasma, which operates at a very high temperature, an example being lightning, and there's also cold plasma, which operates at a relatively low temperature, either at room temperature or slightly above it. You may be asking yourself why cold plasma. It is a form of non-thermal disinfestation, and in comparison to other chemical, radiological, or more thermal forms of disinfestation, it has some advantages, such as it operates at a shorter treatment time, it operates at lower temperatures, it can operate at temperatures as low as 30 to 60 degrees Celsius, and it also has a reduced need for chemicals as it generates ROS, or reactive oxygen species, which contains naturally occurring disinfecting compounds. So overall, it's more environmentally friendly than other forms of disinfestation. My objectives are assess the efficiency of the cold plasma treatment on the C. maculatus insect disinfestation at various stages of their life cycle. I determined the mortality rate of cold plasma treatment on the C. maculatus. And I investigated the impact of voltage and temperature on the mortality rate of the cold plasma treatments on the C. maculatus. For my materials and my methods, starting out with my sample collection, all I used were food to live organic black eyed peas, which were received from Amazon. And also all of the adult Colossal Brucus maculatus that I tested on, I received from the Entomology Research and Education Laboratory. For culturing, I started off by inoculating two jars with a thousand cowpea kernels in each. I then put over a little more than 250 of the adult cowpea weevils in both of the jars. And I left these in incubated conditions of around 27 to 33 degrees Celsius and between 65 to 75% relative humidity. And for these three days, I just gave enough time for the female cowpea weevils to lay their eggs in the outer shell. After these three days, I went back and I separated a little bit more than a thousand of them, only the ones with one egg present on the outer shell. And I separated these into jars with 250 plus in each, leaving a little bit more in extra leaving a little bit extra in each of the jars just for error purposes or if I happen to lose any of the cow peas during the culturing process. All of these four jars were labeled based on the four life stages that completed cow pea weevil's life cycle, those being the egg, larvae one, larvae two, and the pupil phase. And by after putting them in the four jars on day 0, 09, 16, and 23, I introduced them to the cold plasma treatment. How I introduced them to the cold plasma treatment was I used a pin to plate cold plasma treatment device. And the gist of how this works is you can start with voltage as low as 120 volts. And the step up transformer that's present, it steps up the voltage to something as high that can be measured in kilovolts, which is the form of measurement that I use for my experiment. Once this high voltage is applied to both the upper electrode and the bottom electrode or the pin in the plate, the air that's present begins ionizing and forming the cold plasma. And as previously stated, the reactive oxygen species that is generated from the cold plasma is detrimental for the survival of insects. For my methodology, this table just gives a better digital guide as how I introduced each of my samples to the cold plasma treatment. So on day 0, 9, 16, and 23, I put the kernels into 25 small little containers with around 10 in each. I then separated them into five groups of five, and the five groups of five were labeled based on the, both the treatment time and the voltage that they were going to experience. Group one experiencing 15 kilovolts for five minutes, group two, 15 kilovolts for 10 minutes, group three, 20 kilovolts for five minutes, group four, 20 kilovolts for 10 minutes, and my group five was left as the control group, which we left untreated to later on compare the difference in mortality between the samples that were treated by the full plasma versus those that weren't were left untreated. The E and the C present here represent my experimental number, which for each stages of their life cycle was 200, and the control group for each was 50.
For my results, I calculated the mortality for each of the four stages of the calculable's life cycle. And it shows that as the treatment time and the voltage increase, so did the mortality rate, proving the efficiency of the cold plasma treatment. And it also shows that the longer duration of time present for the higher mortality rates, it resulted in a higher mortality as well. So the highest mortality rate present was the egg phase, and my lowest one was larvae one. So this shows that if you tackle these infestation issues early on in the cowpea weevil's life cycle, you're more likely to have a higher mortality with a higher voltage. These bar graphs represent my averages for this experiment. And it shows that the control group for each, which is the first bar in all four of these bar graphs, um, the control group has a significantly lower mortality rate, which is to be expected as that group was left untreated. And all of the samples, the last four bars in each of the graphs, there's a steady increase as the duration and the voltage increases, showing that the cold plasma treatment was proven to be effective and that a higher voltage and duration of time overall increases the mortality rate of these pests. All the treatments range between 40% and 82% mortality. Um, 15 kilovolts for five minutes was proven to be the lowest at 42% and for larvae one. And 20 kilovolts for 10 minutes was proven to be the highest at 82% for the egg phase. All four phases of the insect life cycle were more resistant to lower intensity cold plasma treatments in comparison to the higher intensity treatments. A longer exposure time with a higher voltage equals an increased mortality overall. For future studies, my experiment was originally supposed to be completed over a 50-day period, and I was only able to complete 40 days, as 50 days is the entire life cycle. That's as long as the cowpea weevils are um, predicted to live. So further assessment on the 50th day will be conducted in order to further investigate the effectiveness of the cold plasma treatment overall. And through this further assessment, the cold plasma's effects on the cowpea morphology and the nutrition will be thoroughly examined. Here are my references and my acknowledgments. I would like to thank Dr. Callie for introducing me to this topic for this summer, as well as Shiva, the grad student, who thoroughly assisted me all throughout the summer with completing this very persistent and precise experiment. I would also like to thank Dr. Wiley, Summer, April, and Raymond. She's me giving me this opportunity for this summer. Any questions? Yes. It wasn't part of your assessment, but do you know if that cold plasma treatment impact the flavor profile of the beans? The cold plasma treatment could affect the flavor profile of the beans. I would say yes, as I do know that it's not only. I would say that that would be one of the cons, as I know that it can affect the acidity of the beans. So that's one of the cons in comparison to the other forms of disinfestation. I'm not sure if Dr. Kelly could give a better explanation. And thank you so much for that question. So the idea is that uh, it would affect the anti-nutritional properties of the beans. So that's the hope that we are going to treat it with. So, yeah, we are going to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, so we always glad we're in the house. What would I do without you? I don't know. All right. So, how does everybody feel? I know it's time later. Like, you got the person here because a real job, you'll get fired if you keep pressing down. <laughs> you will not have a job. You've got to persevere and stick this out. All right. So I'm very proud of all the students. Uh, I thank our families that are on Zoom. I thank our professors. I see Dr. Howell. I really appreciate you coming on and everything. Uh, look at you. Um, so Dr. Howell was my uh, parliamentarian when I was national president of Manners. So now he is a professor in the state of Virginia.